Welcome to this year's edition of the Lightning Talks. We have a small but perfectly formed audience. We have a small but perfectly formed lineup. Line up. Five lovely Lightning Talks. And we're starting with Stephen Paul Weber talking about UX stability, freeing users from learned helplessness. Okay, so uh, when I first started thinking about this topic, I used to think that this topic was about uh, non-technical users, uh, which is usually what we think, right? I, I'm good, we're all good, we do everything great, and then we have to fix the problems for the non-technical users. But actually, everyone has this problem. So the problem is that when you use your computer, you get used to it, and, and, and then things change and you hate that. That's basically the problem. Uh, and it turns out that everyone hates this. Right? If you remove a switch from a common terminal command, uh, you will see it on the mailing list. Right? If you, uh, if you completely change the name of that, how many people still type apt get because their fingers can't remember not to type get? Right? We all do this. Uh, it's just that uh, because we're building the software and we care about our own workflows more, we uh, make these changes less often to ourselves. Uh, and so, you know, as somebody who learned how to use Unix a long time ago can get a box today and be mostly like, oh yeah, I can still list files, I can still move around, everything thinks, you know, there's been changes, but nothing too major. On the graphical front, we don't do this, right? Because we're like, oh, I had a new idea for what is better, right? This is a new, better user experience, new, better design, new, better whatever. And so we change things. But in our community, we do a little bit better because usually someone doesn't like it and they fork the old one, right? So when you get GNOME 3, then you get Monty, right? And everybody's happy again a little bit. Uh, so, so we do a little bit better in our community, but over on the other side, where most of the non-technical users still are, because, you know, that's where I started when I was thinking about this topic, um, they don't get that freedom, right? And so they're using their computer today, uh, and then it becomes slow. And so they go to Best Buy and they say to the guy in the store, why is my computer slow? And he says, because you didn't pay me $1,000 for a new one, obviously. So they got a new one and they take it home and nothing works the way that it did before. And so this is, leads to what is often called learned helplessness, where instead of wanting to understand how the system works because that, then they will be able to use it better, they decide the system doesn't work. And so there's no point in, in learning. Uh, and so you see uh, uh, there's a big trend in people not wanting to invest in understanding, you know, how to build workflows for themselves with their systems because they know that in three years they will go get a new one and nothing will work. Uh, and so there's no point. They're going to have to learn again anyway. Uh, and so I think that this is a big opportunity for, uh, for our community to serve the needs not only of ourselves by keeping our terminal commands still mostly working the same, but also everyone else, not by just making GUIs that are maybe pretty, but by making them uh, be familiar and remain familiar over time. So usually when I talk about stability, especially in a Debian context, people think about backporting. Uh, but backporting has all kinds of problems because if you want to backport uh, all the new functionality, well, functionality, you don't necessarily want new functionality, but like bug fixes, security things, for a really, really long time to keep this familiarity, you, you, you can imagine this would get very hard after you know 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. But there are other technical options that you could use. For example, you could port forward only the things that are necessary to change the user experience because it's not really porting in the way that we think with security, right? Usually we think of like take the new code, bring it back. But with user experience, the user doesn't care what the code is, right? So this is more of a, this is maybe a little bit more of an upstream problem, but upstream doesn't care because they had a new idea for the new design. So somebody has to do this. I don't know who has to do it. Maybe it's us, maybe it's somebody else. Uh, but it's when you port forward a user experience, it's not like I copy this code and put it here. It's like I see it and now I make it the same. I don't know. Something like that. This, how much time do I have? Am I done? Two minutes? Okay. One uh, half, really. Tell me why I'm wrong. Shout things at me. Come on, go. Nobody? Does anybody think this is the worst idea I've ever heard? A practical example. So uh, in Firefox, because this is one of the ones that's going to change most often. Uh, for example, uh, if you install Firefox today, you get this button with the three lines on it, and you don't have a menu bar. But that's uh, fine if you're used to things changing, but not fine if you don't want things to change. How hard is it to make that not the case anymore? It's not even that hard. I think it's a config change, because they still have the menu there in the code. They haven't even removed that yet. So if we wanted to ship a browser that still looked and felt more like, right, and it's all, it's all incremental, right, making it exactly the same as like a 
lofty goal, but more like, right? Imagine that you ship configuration such that the Firefox still uses the menu bar. Actually, the distro that I run does this uh, on my wife's laptop uh, because that's very helpful for her. Uh, and so, so that this, that's a practical example, I think, of, of this kind of thing where even anytime I see in a change log visual refresh, right? This is a sign that, that bad, bad times are ahead for all the people that I support because even if visual refresh just means, oh, we drew lots of nice new icons, but the buttons are all in the same place. Well, but, but they're used to this icon and now, now they seconds. have to come and say, where is everything, right? And so this is a problem we have, this is a problem everyone has, and we solve it for ourselves because we build the software and I think that we should solve it for everyone. Hello, uh, my name is Krizen and I'd like to introduce a Debian native approach to user installable packages. Um, when, as a user, we want to use, for example, the SID version of OpenSCAD um, on a system we are not root on, um, there's a stable system, we do something like this, right? Uh, well, mm, not quite. Uh, we can't have, by default, we can't use apt and the package to install packages somewhere outside where the user readable. Um, through the last week, I have assembled some basically workarounds that, that, make, that make this work. So, for example, in, um, to use OpenSCAD as a user, you can use a workaround script that mostly makes the directory and installs a sources list file, then run apt update apt um, install, and you end up with a, even with an icon in the desktop uh, in, the, in the applications menu, and things work fine. Um, this is just built on Debian dependencies, so there are no additional guarantees as with some of the, the image-based or, or more containerist solutions. So it's just, as a user, you install that, you rely on what's, um, what's on the system. So if that goes away, as with anything else you're doing as a user, um, you, um, things, things might break. And if you want to do the minimal approach, that's it. that is, um, for example, if you're installing some game that has three or four dependency trees, um, and most of them is in, on your system, you can mini with that minimally install that, so you just have the game itself and maybe the three or four dependencies that are not installed yet, but that requires um, being in a compatible versioning scheme, so in Debian and not, for example, playing this game between Debian and Ubuntu where there might be an epoch. Uh, there's no sandbox in, involved because that's, I, I see that as an orthogonal issue, and basically I think it should be trivial. Um, so why is this more than setting paths so far? It's usually because um, applications either don't respect the path, or well, most do by now, um, or for example because they, they hard code the path like user share, but there's actually a specification of how an application could um, inspect its environment or read environment variables to discover where its assets are and it turns out um, GTK does that, um, Qt does that and all applications that use one of those libraries to discover their assets just magically work without any recurrence. Um, the path I spend most time working around is maintainer scripts because um, going back a bit um, 
If we are doing something like that, um, that invokes the package um, with a dedicated root directory, um, barely any maintainer script um, knows that there is a variable be uh, called um, the package root because that's not why it's, thank you, that's not widely advertised yet because it's a relatively new feature of the package. But I think that when right now it's being implemented in the package tools itself, so it's just coming up and getting started. But I think that if we if we just follow a few basic guidelines of maybe not touching slash var slash something in in post scripts, but maybe touching the package root slash var, then we can some, make something like um, like this work out of the box without too much effort. Um, so this is this is an approach that works very well for games. This is actually what I started for. It works well for well it's typical kind of leaf applications, um, unless the application needs one of the workarounds for, as I mentioned, okay. XTG root. Um, it works without any change root, LD preload, or other trickery, and it can it's usable right away now. Um, but just not package. Um, for, for quite a few packages. So if you think that this is a good idea, a bad idea, or have any other comments, uh, please contact me. And um, please try it out as soon as I publish it, in which case I will send a link to the packet, uh, to that conference list to announce that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Marga talking about Google's internal Linux. All right, so I work for the internal Linux distribution that it's used at Google for desktops and laptops and a few servers. Um, and if you, okay, uh, I have, we have a nice logo, which is a penguin that we like very much. Um, if you had asked us last year which team I work for, uh, I would have told you that I work for Ubuntu team because we were based on Ubuntu, so we had this like super original name of being called Ubuntu. But if you ask me this year which team I work for, I now work for G Linux team. So why is that? It's because we are no longer being based on Ubuntu. We are moving to be based on Debian. Particularly, we're going to be based on Debian testing, which some people might think it's a bit crazy. Um, uh, yeah, so I had a talk a few days ago, someone that already thought we were moving to Debian and asked me, like, Do, are you interested in coming to the LTS talk? I was like, no, <laughs> that's not what we are doing. So we are going to be based on Debian. How are we doing this? We are going to... Um, take each package that comes from Debian testing, rebuild it, test it, and whether it passes the test, it goes into the release, and if it doesn't pass the test, we will file bugs internally, not externally. Uh, not into the BTS, I, I was just at the auto package test, and they were like, no, no, no automatic backfiling. Well, we have automatic backfiling, but it's internal. Um, yeah, and uh, the tests include our own test plus the auto package tests. Well, we are not yet doing the other package test, but they will include it very soon now. Um, right. And this is how we expect that we will be able to handle being based on testing uh, by doing a lot of testing. And so when is this happening? We are currently in alpha state. We have a few hundred users. And we are launching beta next week on August 16th, which happens to be Debian birthday. It was not originally planned to be that day. We planned to release beta much earlier, but things happen. It's such a nice day. And yeah, it's such a nice day that let's say it was intentional. And after that, like, we, so we will be moving to beta, and after that, we'll see, depending on how our beta goes. Like, we do take the Debian philosophy of we release when it's ready. 
so eventually it will be released. Um, do I have another one? No. Uh, so one thing that I didn't put in the slides, but that uh, I told a couple of people and they were like crazy, we were running Ubuntu Trusty up to now. And we have a tool that upgrades in place from Trusty to stretch black faster, so to whatever is faster now, <laughs> and it works. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's like there's magic involved. Like you have Trusty, then there's magic, and then you have faster. Um, yeah, anyway, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker for the morning is Tamash, talking about making his own thermostat. Come on up. <coughs> there you are. Just a moment. Somehow it's more about open software like Apple Debian and what I did with open software, so open source. So, yeah, I moved to a new place and uh, yeah, I realized that uh, I, had, I had issues. I had issues with the heating system and the Windows issue is, is, is not related to Microsoft but the one which you open if you want fresh air in and it was just just too cold, and I would need to replace them, etc., etc. However, I'm like more like a geek guy, so I'm not really good at replacing the windows, especially in the winter. However, I realized that I might be able to optimize a little bit, like how the heating goes and when it turns on, when it switches off, etc., etc. So, for example, if I like about to go home, I can just check like what the temperature is, and I can tune it. So that was the main idea here. Yes, this is what I said. Uh, multiple rooms, there was just one thermostat, not in the room which I was interested to be like properly heated. So this is what I did. Uh, yeah, I can, I can, uh, I have a remote switch and with that I can switch on and off uh, the heating. I have data collected, so I have uh, <coughs> graphs which I can look at and there are like, uh, uh, yeah, I can measure the temperature in different parts of the uh, house and yeah, I have no cloud, I have no, no like black box products which do some magic which I have no idea about. The internet is optional so if I'm like locally there I can just switch on and off without going out to the internet and this is how I did it. Yeah. This is not that interesting. Yeah, <clears throat> there is also air pressure uh, collected because uh, one of the devices uh, is also does air pressure. And I also downloaded some kind of like Android app which talks MQTT. And uh, this can, I can just tap on these locations and I can just switch on like different devices. And like I can just switch on the heating or I can switch it off. Uh, yeah. So, I have this kind of thermostat, I needed to upgrade it to a di different one, but the point is, uh, if I connect a relay to it, I can just uh, inhibit the heating or turn it on, let it go uh, according to the, like the setup on the thermostat. This is what I have. If I connect the two wires here, then uh, the heating is off. If I open the connection, uh, the heating is off. Uh, that's the main idea. And I put there an ESP. Okay, thanks. I put there a device like this. Yeah, sorry, just a bit of short on time. So this is an ESP uh, microcontroller. Uh, I can I put some like blue interpreter. It it's, it's a free software. So I like like little pieces of code. Like I don't know, like 20 lines of code and I can switch on the relay on and off. It connects to my Wi-Fi, it speaks MQTT, 
So it's it's like a public subscribe the kind of protocol. And yeah, I can switch it on and off. Uh, this is one module uh, which uh, measures the temperature for me and also uh, can measure the air, uh, air pressure. Yeah, <coughs> just a few pictures which I have. <laughs> yeah, it works like this. Uh, I connect to some, the MQTT is a binary protocol. I connect to it uh, uh, with uh, some uh, special client. It's all open source. It's called, for example, there is a broker called Mosquito. And uh, uh, this is similar with, with like uh, long lived HTTP connections, but that it's a sense. binary protocol. Uh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a few links at the end. That's all I have. Sorry, a bit short on time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is anybody feeling inspired at the last minute? Has anybody seen Tincho? No? Well, I will give a quick talk on what's new in the Debian kernel, maybe. In short, I have no idea. As you may have noticed, Ben Hutchins isn't at DevConf this year, so there's no kernel talk. Um, I offered to give it in his stead, you know, do a bit of PowerPoint karaoke, and, you know, give me, give me like five minutes worth of slides, like do lightning talk, he's like, talks don't work that way. <laughs> so, um, I can just encourage you, um, follow Ben Hutchings UK on Twitter, because he posts when there's a new kernel release, and, you know, update early and update often. That's it. And, um, there are no more lightning talk sessions, but there is a live demo session tomorrow in Rex at 11. Thank you very much. You've been a lovely audience.